There were only a few thousand people of European descent living in California in 1845, and when John Fremont arrived in California, he was dressed in rawhide and buckskin and was wearing bandanas on his head, and the locals were more than enthusiastic to see Fremont, and made a flag for themselves emblazoned with a bear to show Fremont how united behind America they were, and most of them were drinking an excessive amount of alcohol as they rallied behind Fremont. President Polk had been elected in November of 1844 and took office in March of 1845, and Polk took f sent Fremont to California right away with secret orders, not to attack the Mexicans, but to negotiate a treaty with them. Fremont's father had fled the French Revolution, and Fremont worked for U.S. Ace, that was the Red Castle Army Corps of Engineers, and the Bear Flaggers were opposed to the Mexican government that had done nothing to protect them from Indian raids, and they believed the Mexicans had been actively encouraging the Indians to attack American settlers, so the arrival of Fremont gave the Californians hope that the U.S. government would build forts and send soldiers to keep the Indians at bay and Captain Fremont was embraced as their savior. Fremont's army was a strange multinational force of buckskin rogues and filibusters. One non-combatant observer described them as, quote, Americans, French, English, Swiss, Poles, Russians, Chileans, Germans, Greeks, Austrians, and Pawnees. Blood and Thunder, an epic of the American West by Hampton Sides, New York Anchor Books, a division of Random House, Inc., 2006, page 118. The secret orders from P President Polk told Fremont to prepare to fight the British over possession of the entire West Coast, all the way up to Vancouver Island and Fremont was supposed to get California into the Union as a non-slave state, while the army faction in the government wanted to turn Southern California into a slave state. Polk told Fremont that negotiations were underway for Britain to leave the Pacific Northwest below the boundary of the 49th latitude, and the timing was perfect because the British were busy with their opium wars in China and had no interest at that time in getting into another shooting war with America. On the 1st of November in 1845, Polk sent Marine Lieutenant Archibald Gillespie with orders for the Navy that was parked off the shores of Northern California, and the dispatch had included specific orders for Captain Fremont. Gillespie went by steamship from New York to Veracruz, then overland to Mazatlan, and by whaling ship to Hawaii, then east to California on an American man-o'-war whereupon Gillespie headed up the Sacramento River in search of Fremont, who had established a northern base at the upper Klamath Lake in Oregon. By the time Gillespie got to California, things had gotten rather out of hand, because when Fremont had gone back to San Francisco to complete his purchase of Alcatraz Island, he'd gotten waylaid by the Bear Flaggers, who were swearing allegiance to Captain Fremont and would refuse to submit to the Army's General Kearney when he showed up a year later and tried to order Fremont out of California. Lieutenant Gillespie claimed to have destroyed the paper orders from Polk during his journey to California and said he'd committed them to memory out of fear they might be confiscated by Mexicans. The local bear flaggers told Gillespie exactly where to find Fremont up the Sacramento River at Sutter's Fort, and from there Gillespie borrowed a horse and went north to Oregon and found Fremont on the 8th of May, delivering the orders from Polk, and President Polk had sent Gillespie because Texas had just been admitted as a slave state. The vote to make Texas the 28th state had gone through the Democrat Congress, and President Polk would have to sign it by Christmas of 1845, so that meant California would have to come in free, and Polk knew that Fremont was the man for the job. 
One faction in Washington, D.C. wanted to split California into two states, a Northern California that was free and a Southern California that was slaveholding. With the line between the slave and free states extended from the East Coast out to the Pacific Ocean, but there was not another free state available to bring in for the North to maintain the political balance, so Polk demanded that California come in entirely as one free state to counterbalance Texas coming in with slavery. The annexation of Texas meant certain war with Mexico, so it was imperative that Fremont and the Navy save the whole of California for America to deprive Mexico of using the west coast above Baja for military operations. The Navy sent Gillespie by sea to Veracruz, while five American warships set sail around South America to arrive off the California coast in the summer of 1846, and a British man-o'-war named the Collingwood arrived shortly thereafter sporting eighty guns, and in Gillespie's dispatch included the warning to Fremont that General Kearney's army was marching across the southwest with the goal of seizing southern California for slavery. There were 10,000 Mexicans living in California at the time, a small number compared to the British, who had their eye on the west coast of America, and only the Russians had stood in the way of the British. The Russians had a fort just north of San Francisco, and Russians had settled all around Bodega Bay, Bodega Bay, and well inland from there, and while there were a few Indians in California, the British had become experts at dealing with native aboriginals after all the practice they'd had the war world over. Fremont did not like the British because he'd grown up listening to his father's tales about them, and as Gillespie was making his way north to Fremont's outpost at Klamath Lake, the Indians were carrying the news of the coming war on the wind. As soon as Fremont received his orders from Gillespie, the Indians who thought they were under the protection of the British attacked Fremont's camp on the 9th of May, killing two of his men, and Fremont went after them three days later. The Indians who had attacked Fremont at Klamath Lake had been using English weapons, and Britain had been supplying the Indians for a long time with metal arrowheads from the Hudson's Bay Company post up the Columbia River. Fremont's reprisal was purposely brutal and undertaken in order that the survivors would spread the news that the Americans were now at war with Britain in the Pacific Northwest. On his way back to Sutter's Fort, Fremont did the Sutter Buttes massacre on the 30th of May, and Sutter Buttes was 50 miles northwest of Sutter's Fort, and Fremont called them the Three Buttes, and they were at the center of the entire Indian region of Northern California, where all the different tribes regularly came together to practice kuksu cult rituals. Kuksu was the creed common to all the Indians of Northern California, and its headquarters was at these three Sutter Buttes, and the Indians believed that this was the place where they could ascend to the afterlife. When Fremont did the Sutter Buttes massacre, the news of his war with Britain went out like lightning, and within two weeks there was not an Indian in the Pacific Northwest who did not know that the British presence in the territory had just met its match. The British Drake had named San Francisco Nova Albion in 1579, a Latin derivative of New England, and the Mexican government had been offering to sell California to the British for cash, so President Polk authorized Fremont to offer the Mexicans in California protection from the British, and Polk had ordered Fremont to accomplish this or to die trying. Fremont had married the woman with whom Polk had fallen in love before she met Captain Fremont, and Polk was well aware that Fremont's mission was a dangerous one, not only from Indian attacks or Mexican soldiers, but mostly because the British desired to add the West Coast to their list of colonies. Britain's primary goal in gaining California was as a place to export thousands of Irish Catholics who were causing trouble back home. 
and Fremont and Kit Carson and their men fraternized with the sailors from the British warship Collingwood in Monterey Bay and enjoyed each other's company, and in so doing, Fremont spread the news to the British about America's intention to incorporate the Pacific Northwest into the Union. A treaty was signed back in Washington, D.C. that month on the 15th of June that was called the Oregon Treaty, and then Fremont went back up to San Francisco, 100 miles north of Monterey, and Sacramento was another 100 miles northeast of San Francisco, and Sutter's Fort was 30 miles northeast of Sacramento up the American River from the Sacramento. Governor Vallejo had been running California as though he were a European baron, but in the middle of the night on the 14th of June, Fremont and his drunken bear-flaggers showed up at the governor's house in Sonoma, 30 miles north of Oakland, and they helped themselves to Mr. Vallejo's wine cellar, and they broke into his private liquor cabinet, and then they convinced Vallejo to sign a surrender, and then Fremont seized the Presidio in San Francisco. In July, Commodore Robert F. Stockton arrived in Monterey Bay and took command of the three American frigates carrying 500 men each, along with a ship of the line with 800 sailors aboard and four sloops with 200 men each, as well as their three supply ships. Stockton had been asked to be the Secretary of the Navy in previous years, but he declined because he wanted to work on building steam-powered warships, the first of which was the USS Princeton, launched in 1843 under Stockton's command, and it had been christened with a bottle of American whiskey. The Princeton had an iron hull and two big guns named the Peacemaker and the Oregon, and the Princeton had been the very first screw-driven ship built for the U.S. Navy. Stockton had been born in Princeton, New Jersey, and his grandfather had been a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and Stockton had designed one of the guns on board the Princeton, and the other one he'd Oh, and the one he designed blew up, killing some very important people, so Stockton found out that he was not an engineer and stuck to learning about command rather than trying to be an inventor. When Stockton learned that the war with Mexico had been declared in May of 1846 by reading about it in the local Mexican newspaper, Stockton promoted Fremont to major and Gillespie to captain and made Kit Carson a lieutenant, and Stockton sent Fremont and his men aboard the sloop of war Cyane to sail for San Diego, and they went ashore with the Marines and planted the American flag. Stockton's ship, the Congress, sailed from Monterey to Santa Barbara and did the same, and then both ships met in Los Angeles to find out that the Mexican governor had fled to Baja. Fremont signed the Treaty of Cahuenga on the 13th of January in 1847, ending the war with Mexico for America, although the war would go on in Mexico for another year, and Fremont signed the treaty in the town that would later become Universal City. The American army, led by General Kearney, would march in three weeks after the Navy docked in Los Angeles, and the Army-Navy fight between Commodore Stockton and General Kearney would begin, and Fremont would get caught in the crossfire. Stockton had appointed Fremont the governor of California and commander of the California Battalion Militia, and he had authorized Fremont to sign the Treaty of Cahuenga, and by the time Fremont had put an end to the war with Mexico, his men had killed a total of eleven bears, and at one point a bee had guided Fremont out of battle, which meant a lot to his Mormon friends. The war had been all but over when the army led by General Kearney arrived in Los Angeles after marching across the Arizona desert and Stockton and Kearney were the same age and held the same rank, and when Kearney arrived in California he was disgusted with Fremont's Indian clothing that he viewed as distinctly unmilitary. General Kearney had been protecting settlers and wagon trains from Indians for the army for two decades, and so Fremont's dressing in buckskin had particularly offended him. 
Commodore Stockton's written reports about his victory in Los Angeles had been sent off by mule to President Polk with Kit Carson and a dozen men and six Delaware Indians, and Kit Carson swore he would reach Washington, D.C. within sixty days, but he ran into Kearney's army marching towards California when they were eleven days out of Santa Fe, and Kearney ordered Kit Carson to turn around and guide Kearney's three hundred men across the Arizona desert to Los Angeles. Kearney convinced Kit Carson to do this duty because a Mexican had been captured carrying letters boasting about an uprising of insurgents in Los Angeles that was keeping Stockton and Fremont at bay, and General Kearney had been planning his military excursion to California for years after learning in 1842 that the Mexicans were involved in the opium trade with China. Kit Carson told General Kearney that only one-third of his men would survive the journey across the Arizona desert, so Kearney sent two hundred of his soldiers back to Santa Fe, where they were needed to fight Navajos. And when Kearney and Kit Carson got within thirty miles of Los Angeles, they were gravely attacked by Mexicans, and Kit Carson snuck through the Mexican lines by walking barefoot those thirty miles, because he'd removed his boots at night when they were making too much noise, and he'd lost them in the dark. Kit Carson reached Commodore Stockton in December of 1846, and Stockton sent three hundred marines to relieve Kearney just in the nick of time, and this story was described in glorious detail in the chapter Cold Steel of Blood and Thunder, and these marines who saved General Kearney's battered army were led by the same Gillespie who had delivered the secret orders to Fremont at Sutter's Fort. Two thousand miles from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to the bitter end of the continent, there had never been a march like it in American history. Blood and Thunder, page 205. When General Kearney finally arrived with less than 100 men, Fremont had already been appointed the governor of California by Commodore Stockton, and after putting Fremont in charge, Commodore Stockton was planning on sailing down to invade the west coast of Mexico. Stockton's marines had just saved Kearney's bacon back in the desert, but there would be neither gratitude nor grace coming from General Kearney, and President Polk had known full well there would be no compromise between the anti-slavery navy and Kearney's pro-slavery army. So to counter the pow power of the army, President Polk had sent a contingent of 800 Marines on private ships to California that arrived in San Francisco on the 6th of March in 1847, and these troops were to occupy the newly won territory of California from San Francisco down to the Baja, and President Polk had also sent Colonel Richard Mason to relieve Kearney. When Mason arrived, his orders were to promote Fremont to lieutenant colonel, and when General Kearney learned from Mason that Kearney was to be relieved on the 31st of May, Kearney ordered Fremont to stand down, but Fremont refused to take orders from Kearney, and so did his men. It wasn't that Fremont was being insubordinate to the chain of command in the army, which would have made Kearney and not Stockton Fremont's boss, but that Fremont had been authorized in wartime by the Navy, not the Army, and more importantly, Fremont was simply standing up for his own men. For reasons remaining unknown to History Anonymous, Fremont challenged Mason to a duel, and so President Polk ordered Fremont to join a cavalry unit in Mexico, but Fremont never showed up staying instead in California and calling himself the commander of the Naval Battalion of Mounted Ri Volunteer Riflemen. Kearney ordered Fremont's arrest and proceeded to take him back to Washington, D.C. for quir a courts martial, charging him not just with insubordination, but with mutiny and a slew of other related offenses, and Kearney would accompany Fremont under arrest back to Washington, D.C., since Kearney had been ordered to go back himself, 
and they left on the 31st of May in 1847 to convey Fremont back for trial, and they took the California Trail that went through Fort Bridger before joining the Oregon Trail, and on the way east, they buried some of the Donner Party's remains.